Okay. Are we good? Yes. All right. So I have a lapel mic because Bill asked me, he said, are you okay with just using the mic at the stand? And I said, I would say yes, but I'd have a tendency to walk around a lot when I'm preaching. I can't help it. Uh, so anyway. If you'll turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of John, chapter 8 is where we're going to begin. And it's so, I, it's awesome to me just exactly how well God works things the way that He wants them. Earlier in the week, Bill had sent me an email and asked me, he said, uh, do you want to select a Old Testament scripture and a New Testament scripture to go along with your message that you're going to preach? Or would you like me to select something? And I asked him, I said, I don't want to select anything. I said, but if you will prayerfully select two scriptures, we will see what the Lord does on Sunday. So the scriptures that were shared this morning, along with the music, actually fits with the message that the Lord led me to this morning. This has happened so many times throughout my almost 20 years of preaching. And I love to continue to see how God acts and how He choreographs things because it's just another testament to me how much God does not really need our, our help. He doesn't need our instruction. He doesn't need our ideas. God already has a plan. We are His tools. We are His vessels to do the work of the Lord that He gives us. So one of the things that I'm going to address this morning that we find is how many of you are familiar with the, the account the, of the adulterous woman? that we find in the New Testament. There, this is a, a part of Scripture that is so widely misused and misunderstood. Uh, one of the things, and like Bill had mentioned earlier, is that I'm very passionate about God. I love God more than anything else. I did not grow up in the church, um, but the Lord delivered me from a willful life of sin uh, and the direction that I was headed. There was a time in my life that I mocked God and I mocked the people who said that they loved God and the people that would go to church and I looked at it as a waste of time. I actually had looked at it and said that those people are completely ignorant. But later in life I find myself being so grateful to God, humbled by the very gift that He offers us through the sacrifice that He made. And through that understanding... And God leading me more and more into it, I commit myself to studying the Word of God. I've taken several translations over the years because I'm, I'm sorry, but just because there's a translation out there that you like the sound of, that doesn't mean it is accurate with Scripture. Just because it sounds good doesn't mean it's correct. So I commit to studying various translations of the Bible. I take them back to the original Hebrew and Greek that they were written in for immediate translation into English to get a more in line uh, direction with Scripture. I love it. And I've never in my life been a person who liked to read. I hated reading, but I love to read the Bible. I love to study the Word of God. And if you'll understand that in Scripture we are instructed to study Scripture, not just merely read over it. So as we begin this morning, I want you to bear in mind, uh, I'm going to break this down in segments for you to help translate, to give you the full picture of what's going on here. Okay, so chapter 8, verse 1 of the book of John. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him and sat down, and he taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. In the very act. This was a horrible crime back in, the, back in Bible times. It was a crime that was deserving of death. And not just death, but by way of stoning. Stoning someone to death. Now, when I read this and I study the Scripture, I picture the scribes and the Pharisees. I picture them bringing this woman before Christ. 
And here's the thing. They didn't bring, him, bring her to him privately. They didn't catch him out on the street and say, oh, there he is down on the corner. Let's bring her to him. No, they wanted to humiliate him. They brought him in the midst of, in front of Christ and all these people that Jesus was teaching. Now, the big thing at that time was the law, especially the law of Moses that he had brought. Okay? And so they were doing anything and everything they could to get Christ to break any of the laws of Moses because that was horrible. Okay? But now they've got this woman who was caught in the act of adultery. They want to get rid of her, but they're thinking, oh, you know what? We can get him. If he will break one of the laws of Moses, we can stone both of them and be rid of them both. They definitely wanted rid of Jesus, and we read that throughout the New Testament, clear up until we get to the point of His apprehension and His crucifixion. They despised Him greatly. So they bring her in the midst, in front of Christ and the witnesses. So she was caught in the very act, and they remind Him in verse 5. Now Moses, in the law, commanded... That's not, just, that's not a suggestion, that's being commanded. That the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. Now, I love this next part. And this is one of the areas where people misunderstand. This is where some of the misunderstanding comes. In the next verse, in verse 6, it says, or sorry, they said to him, testing him that they might have something to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and began to write upon the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. I can assure you that he heard them. A lot of people look at that and they say, they make the determination, well, he ignored them because they, they weren't worth acknowledging. That's not true. That's not true at all. Jesus heard everything they said and he was taking it into account. Jesus was demonstrating that we're commanded in James chapter 1. And you're going to see that unfold in this. James chapter 1 verse 19 says that, Beloved, we are to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Jesus did not just give us instruction. He did not just give us commands in which to live by. He gave us examples to follow. He lived out the very instruction that He gave His people that He gives us. He lived by example. So many times through the Bible, especially in the New Testament, that we are instructed to mirror the image, the, not the look, but the ways of Christ, that we ourselves may become Christ-like. So he stooped down and he's writing on the ground. It says then that he just basically acted as though he didn't hear them. Verse 7, So when they continued asking him, so I want you to picture these scribes and these Pharisees, they're standing around and they're not just saying, hey, Hey, teacher, uh, this lady here, was, uh, she was caught in adultery. What do you think we should do? They were making a scene. Have you ever known anyone or have you ever seen where somebody's done it? They're being agitators. They're trying to provoke a situation. They're trying to provoke someone. So they're being loud and they're being boisterous. They're standing out there and they're standing around Jesus. And there wasn't just one or two of them, but talking about, Hey, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. This is what Moses said that we're supposed to do. But what do you say we should do? Hey, Jesus, come on. What are we supposed to do? Speak up. So Jesus answers them. But I promise you it was not in a way that they expected. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. And again, he stooped back down to the ground and wrote. Then those who heard it, being convicted, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the least. Now, why do you suppose that was? Why did it start with the oldest? What's that? They knew better. They knew better. That's right. We have heard from generation to generation the older people are to set the example. Are we not? 
The older people are to set the example. They knew better. They had been, these were not just everyday average Joes out here on the street. These were people who spent much time in the temple. These were scribes and Pharisees. They were very familiar with the law and the teachings. And being convicted one by one, starting with the oldest, they began to leave because they were convicted. So here's what I want you to understand. This is not Jesus condoning sin and convincing them that, hey, it's really not a big deal. It's not what's going on here. We continue to read. So, and unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Verse 10. When Jesus had raised himself up, he saw no one but the woman. He said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? Understand, acknowledging or confronting sin is not the same thing as condemning. Okay? She said, no one, Lord. She didn't just reply, no one. She replied, no one, Lord. During this time, this woman obviously had remorse. Obviously was sorrowful. And in her heart, she come to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. He's not condemning her. But I want you to get this, this whole part right here. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Jesus had offered forgiveness. This is what he did. He didn't condone her sin. He didn't say, it's not a big deal. Go and do what you want to do. It's okay. It's not what he did. Jesus acknowledged her sin because she was, she was obviously caught. And she was caught by multiple witnesses. Jesus acknowledged her sin. But he did not condemn her, nor did he allow them to condemn her either. Why? Because every one of those who stood there, probably with stones in their hands, they themselves too were guilty of sin. Jesus tells us that we are not to judge with condemnation. We don't have the right to condemn anyone. We don't have the authority. That's reserved for the judge. And you and I, we are not the judge. Do we judge one another? Are we to judge one another? We're to judge sin. Is it sin? Is it not sin? Jesus instructs us later in the New Testament that we are to judge with righteous judgment. We judge the character of individuals every day. Job places. When people turn in applications, a determination is being made. Is this person trustworthy? Can, will they be reliable? We judge character. We judge our intentions. Are our intentions true or are they false? But we do not have the right to condemn anyone. What Jesus did here was He acknowledged her sin and because of her, re her remorse, her repentance, He forgave her. But He instructed her just as we're instructed that when we surrender, and I want you to understand, salvation is not some dainty little game of repeat. You don't get to go and decide when Jesus saves you or not. Scripture tells us, Jesus is the one who addresses it, says that no one can come to Him unless the Father draw them to Him. I can tell you years ago when I found myself in Scripture studying the Word of God, I questioned God. I wanted to know, God, are you really real or am I just talking to the air? Because this seems really stupid to me. But through the Holy Spirit convicting me, guiding me through more and more of Scripture. And here I'm going to share with you part, the, the, the beginning of my testimony. How I began to come to the conclusion that God is really real and He is genuine. And He is the only one and only living God. 
So during that time that I was questioning, I was wanting answers and I was like, God, are you really there? I need to know because I've done some horrible stuff in my life and I, I would love to be forgiven for it. Jesus saves by grace through faith. The Holy Spirit led me back to my seventh grade science class. Coach Tweedy was my science teacher. He also taught basketball, girls, uh, coached girls basketball. That's why he was called Coach Tweedy. And in science class this particular day, we were studying about nature and about, well, we were studying oxygen. Without oxygen, you and I would cease to be able to exist. We would die. Our lungs would literally like almost implode. They would shrivel up and we would, basically, we would choke to death. Oxygen is not produced in some big mass factory that's found in Chicago or New York City. Oxygen is produced by those things that we see outside. Those beautiful green trees, the grass, the bushes, all the shrubbery out there, all the foliage. All these things produce oxygen that you and I have to have. If you go back to Scripture and you read in Genesis, we, real, we learn that all of these elements were in place before mankind was created. They were put there for our good, for our benefit. So learning about this, about oxygen and carbon dioxide. How many of you know what carbon dioxide is? Well, it's the very stuff that we breathe out. We breathe out carbon dioxide. We cannot live on it. It's actually poisonous for us to over just a short period of time to, to breathe that in. So how in the world, so I kind of got worried when I was thinking all of this. It's like, all right. So I got to that point, I'm like, wait a minute, carbon dioxide? Well, there's an ozone layer, and if we breathe out all this carbon dioxide, we're polluting the earth and we're all going to die. That was my, my thought at the time. But as you go on into that seventh grade science lesson, the same very elements that produce oxygen that our bodies need, they absorb this poison that we breathe out and they regenerate it into oxygen. That's a seventh grade science lesson for you. And that is also about the love and the creativity and the design of Almighty God. So at that moment, I realized, wow, because we can't take credit for all of these things being there. And according to Scripture, they were there before we were created. But they obviously serve us. They, they benefit us. They're there for our good. And Scripture says that all that God created is for our good. And as we read and we study more into Scripture, how can you not recognize that there is a sovereign God and He is real and He loves us. And at that time, in all in being confronted... Because God confronted me with my sin and the fact that I do need a Savior. He didn't say, Billy, I'm willing to ignore your sin. Just do what you want. That, friends, is ignorant. To think that we have a free pass and that we can treat Jesus like He's our get-out-of-jail-free card and we can do anything we please. We are instructed through Scripture to walk in loving obedience to the Father. I used to look at the commands in the Bible as a checklist, a lot of do's and don'ts, and man, that just bored me to death. I was like, really? It's a book of a lot of do's and don'ts, and I can't ever have fun. But that's not the case. When you look at the Word of God and the commands that God gives us to live by, love your neighbor as yourself. How can you see that as being harmful or boring or unfair? But first and foremost is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. It's out of love that we are compelled to walk in obedience to God. I love to honor God more than I've ever loved to honor myself or my flesh. When my wife and I, when we met, and I love it because she, she feels the same way that I do, 
I love her. I love her more than anybody else in this world. But she knows that she is second place to God. And that's just the way it has to be. I love God more than anything else. I love God more than the very breath that I breathe. Someday I'll get to share some more of my testimony with you about how it is that I'm... Because every one of you see me standing up here. You've seen me walk in and out of this place. But I was supposed to be bound to a wheelchair before I was 34 years old. And I'm, I'm steadily creeping up on 50. Again, there is no limit to the things that God can do and that He wants to do in our lives and through us. Now, like this adulterous woman, she didn't verbally come out and plead with Him and repent. But Jesus knew what was going on. Within her heart, this woman was repentant. Jesus offered up forgiveness and the instruction to go and sin no more. Here's the thing that's even better. Philippians 4.13, somebody quote it to me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That doesn't mean that Jesus gives you the power to go over here and leap over tall buildings. Okay? Because once we are in Christ, we now are able to come before the throne of grace for the help that we need to turn from sin. We are given this opportunity to call on the name of Jesus Christ, who has the strength and who displayed it on this earth for 40 days and nights, that He was tempted, but He sinned not. To call on His name... Because in and of myself, in my flesh, Billy does not have the strength to overcome and turn away from sin. Or areas where I was weak. But Jesus does. And to call on His name and ask Him to give me the strength. Scripture says that He, when we are faced with temptation, He provides us a way out. And that is through the strength of Christ. Nowhere in Scripture does it say, go in, jump into the lion's den and face sin and all your weaknesses. No, it says to flee from sin. Flee from it. That we not fall into temptation. I hope that this has helped you to understand this Scripture better. Jesus does not give us a free pass to sin and do as we wish in our flesh. Jesus will confront us with our sin. He will acknowledge our sin. And He's the only one who can condemn anyone. But just like this woman here, that with a repentant heart. And that was the thing that Jesus first preached in the beginning of His ministry. Y'all remember that? Reading that in the first, four, the first four books of the New Testament. Jesus said to go and tell the people to repent. I tell that with people. A lot of people say, Jesus, no, He never told people anything about sin. Oh, yes, He did. He told the people, He said, to go and tell the people to repent. Repent of their sins. Repent does not only mean to say, oh, yeah, I sin, and okay, I know I'm really not supposed to do that. No, that's not repenting. Repenting means to be sorrowful and to turn from your sin, to acknowledge it, and turn from it. We are given the strength to turn from it, to overcome the weaknesses that we've been ensnared in all this time, but also for Jesus to stand there and say, because I have forgiven you, I have cast your sins as far from you as the east is from the west into the deepest depths of the sea, ne'er to return to you again. I will not hold them against you. That, my friends, is a living Savior. And I'm so grateful that Jesus saved me. I'm so glad that He is here and that He is with us and that we have His instruction. Truth is like a two-edged sword. It cuts and it can hurt. I'm so grateful that years ago, before my conversion, that I had an old Baptist preacher who was willing to confront my sin to me and tell me. And I was mad at him for a while, 
but this man had spoke truth to me. He didn't do it with condemnation. He didn't do it out of hatred. He did it out of love. And he told me, he said, Billy, he said, where you're headed, you do not want to go. This is not going to end well for you. That's not what I wanted to hear. We are in a day and age where everybody is so sensitive about everything. But do not withhold being truthful with one another. You and I, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are commanded to hold one another up, hold each other accountable, to encourage one another. Not to do as we jolly well please, but to walk in love with the Lord and with each other. It's one of the reasons that the Bible talks about that we are to fellowship with one another, that we encourage each other, strengthen each other, and help each other. Sometimes that help comes in the form of coming up to you and saying, Hey, Billy, hey, man, I saw what you were doing. And, brother, this is not right. You confront someone with their sin, you do it the right way, you do it out of love. You treat them the same way that you would want to be treated. Understand that. When I'm clo closing this morning, I want you to understand that even when Jesus confronts us with our sin, and He will rebuke us, and if you think He won't, there's several scriptures to support it. Revelation 3.19, Jesus says, For as many as I love, I will chastise and rebuke. And if that's the case, I know Jesus loves me a lot. <laughs> and I tell you that when you read through the New Testament, I really honestly believe that there was no one that Jesus chastised and rebuked more than Peter. But He fervently loved Peter. And He loves you and I. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are truly, truly grateful to You. We thank You for Your inerrant Word. We thank You for salvation that we have through the sacrifice of Your Son, Jesus Christ, my Lord. Father, I pray that the words spoken here today honored You. And that You are pleased with me. I pray that you speak into the hearts of each and every one here today. Guide us, Lord, that we may know you as you desire to be known. I pray that you give us the strength that we need to do the things that you desire of us. May we praise, honor, and glorify you all the days of our life. May we lift up your precious name. Strengthen us. Father, help us to live the abundant life that you came to give us to be pleasing to you. We thank you, Lord. We love you. And this we pray and we ask in Jesus' name. And God's children said...